Awesome. Thank you. So uh, I thought we'd just hang out, and I would try to give you some tips on how you might influence your business. How many of you are product manager and feel like you're totally empowered to influence the business at any point? Show of hands. OK. So it's a common problem. Um, and most of us, the way we create products, we want them to last. So think of a product that you miss now that it's gone. Probably came to you pretty quickly, huh? Yeah. And it may not be something you worked on, but it's something that you know, really solved the problem, that's passionate. You just referred it to your friends. Um, I made the mistake of asking people on Twitter last week, uh, what, just give me one. And it was really cool. Um, here's a few. There are everything from that little flip camera, which I do have at home in a desk somewhere. Um, Doritos 3Ds, I mean, I didn't know that that was like a thing that people were just lusting after still. Uh, and then a bunch of music apps that we all know and, and love that have gone away. Uh, and then there was this another one that came up a few times, Something Reader, you may have heard of it. Um, wow, you guys loved your Google Reader, didn't you? Like, it was just, I had to turn notifications off, so. But anyway, I'm going to talk about Clearly Canadian. And uh, maybe because I'm a child of the 90s, I personally think that this was the drink that defined the 90s, OK? Now, some of you might say, no, it was Zima. And I would say, you are wrong. Um, I would put Zima as a solid number two. But I think your memories of Zima are probably fogged through a haze of college binge drinking. And if you really revisited Zima today, you'd have a different opinion. But this stuff was amazing. Uh, I personally like the mountain blackberry. It came in this nice teardrop shaped glass bottle that was really thick. Um, I was the only one that really loved it. It made, uh, they had $155 million of revenue in 93. So clearly, it was working. And then before you know it, it was, it was kind of gone. And um, it, you know, you'd go to a store, and it used to be everywhere, and then it was in fewer places, and then you really couldn't find it at all. And I thought, you know, being a nerd, uh, I started looking at it through the lens of design thinking and product management, and I started thinking, okay, well, was it desirable? Well, yeah, it was desirable. I mean, uh, people loved the stuff. I wasn't the only one. It was like literally on the show Friends and other places. Was it viable? Well, somewhat. I mean. Back then, if you had a soda, it was still around 50 cents for a soda, you know, mid-90s. This stuff started like a buck 25 or so and went all the way up to two dollars. So, you know, the idea of like, well, I'm going to pay more for this kind of clear, refreshing drink. And then was it feasible? Well, clearly they had some feasibility problems. And it wasn't just the product, it was distribution and, and making it kind of a sustainable thing. So uh, the good news is it, it was brought back. So a VC acquired Clearly Canadian. They, they ran a, a crowdfunding campaign. And 750K <laughs> pre-sold, pre which is pretty crazy when you think about it. And, um, and now you can find it in a few stores here in, in the Bay Area. And you'll notice it's not everywhere now. There's only a few stores. It's mostly kind of world market cost plus. But I started thinking of these themes. And, and as product managers, you know and kind of live and breathe these themes. Um, you know, desirability being do they, uh, viability being kind of should we, uh, and should we from a financial, um, you know, is it financially viable perspective? You should also have a moral compass on should we as well, but I'm, I'm speaking more financially. And then uh, feasibility being can we. And I think, um, I mean, I first came across this as like the old school Keeley Triangle. I don't know if you remember that. It used to be on the Stanford D School's website. Um, I personally define feasibility a little broader than just technical feasibility. I think there's a lot of things that could get in your way. Uh, even though it's technically feasible to create the product, regulatory environments, other things that might prevent you from, from executing. So, you know, as a product manager, you kind of have this somewhat influence of the product, and, and you feel like, I want to influence the business. I want to be able to, you know, help this thing live on and sustain, especially if it solves a real problem, and, and you're getting that feedback from the, from the market that it, is, that it is desirable. But then you start realizing, well, my product it kind of exists in the context of a business model, okay? And then that kind of exists in the context of the organization. And so you're kind of at the center of that. And it's really interesting, the language of uh, product management over the years, I've kind of seen it change, right? It's been, uh, well, you're the CEO of the product. And you're like, yes, I'm totally CEO of the product. But like, nobody listens to me. I have no influence. 
So now I reject that notion. I am definitely not the CEO of the product. And then you start realizing, well, nobody really listens to the CEO most of the time either. So maybe I am the CEO of the product. <laughs> and so I feel that, you know, especially this day and age, uh, and that you all have embraced kind of experimentation, that you actually do have quite a bit of influence over the business model and over the organization. You just kind of need the right levers. Another way to think about this is kind of like through a tool, something like the business model canvas, which you all probably use. Your product is really a small piece of that whole business model. You know, you kind of uh, exist in just the resource. That's kind of where you are. And it's crazy because when I first kind of learned this tool in, uh, back in like 2010 or so, I would put the product like right in the middle. I would say, that's the product. And, you know, when you start realizing, no, it's, you know, the value proposition is kind of more important. Like, the perceived value of the product. So your product is kind of more of a resource. So then you start thinking through, okay, well, I have this product. Can I influence a value proposition? Can I actually distribute it to a customer? Uh, can we build relationships over time? Can we generate revenue? <laughs> That's really important, too. And then on the backstage, like activities and resources, that was all, those are all costs. And then, you know, should we partner with somebody that brings activities or resources that we, we don't have? And then you start realizing it's like a system. It's like a system. So, and then you quickly realize that it's a bunch of assumptions and unproven hypotheses. Because, you know, you assume you can use that distribution channel, but maybe you can't. Especially if you're going through retail, but maybe the retail has, has kind of shrunk a little bit. And so, what I've found is that you already have the tools to kind of address this. Um, using this kind of framing of desirable, viable, feasible also applies to the business model. And Alex and I have been working on this for a while. But if you start overlaying that, you can kind of use your product thinking to start looking holistically at the business model. And so you start to understand, OK, so desirability is really my value proposition, my customer segment, my channels, my relationships, those are all kind of like desirability-themed assumptions. And then viability is kind of at the bottom there with regards to your revenue stream and your cost structure. And then feasibility is not just technical feasibility, but it's also, you know, regulatory, it's patents, it's all this stuff that's kind of around, around feasibility. It's infrastructure, really. So once you've started to identify those assumptions, it's like, well, now what? I mean, OK, I understand as a product manager, I can kind of use this tool set that I already have and influence the, you know, start to influence the business, but like, where do I go? And so um, kind of getting grown up in the Lean Startup community, I've noticed a lot of that language get pulled into product management. And I'm really pleased by that. I was here last year. I saw uh, a lot of talks on how do we experiment. And so for those of you not familiar with that, it's like, okay, well, we have this build, measure, learn loop, right? So we build, and we measure, and we learn, and we kind of go through that loop as fast as possible. For those of you that don't know, think Top Gun. Have you seen the movie Top Gun? It's like Top Gun applied to business, and that's all you need to think about. So the problem with this loop, and like I said, I've been doing this about 10 years now, is that we always start with build. <laughs> It, uh, we always do. If I'm working with a startup out here, they've already built like some kind of crazy uh, AI. They've built a chat bot. They've built like something Internet of Things, which is my favorite, by the way, because it's like something connect to the Internet, question marks, profit. And we really <laughs> should probably start questioning that a little more. And then we go to a build again, because there's more stuff in the backlog. There's more stuff. Um, on your roadmap to build, and then you kind of build some more, and then it just becomes this build loop. So, <laughs> so I still like the loop, all right? Uh, over the years, uh, I've learned you, you, you have to kind of start here. You have to start with learn. And so when you start with learn, it's really nuanced, but, but it's important, that you start asking those questions. Do they? Should we? Can we? Is it desirable, viable, feasible? And then you can go to, OK, so what do we need to build to learn that? And we might not need to build anything. Maybe you just need to write a script and go out and, and perform interviews. Maybe you build a landing page. Um, maybe you build some kind of MVP. But it's really interesting to me that you're not building to build. You're kind of building to learn, right? And if you do that well, then you're going to be able to measure because it's going to have qualitative 
which is more the why, so a lot of the interviews. If you do intercepts on a landing page and kind of chat bar or something to intercept those people, you'll get some qualitative. And then quantitative, which is you know, what the what people are doing. If you instrument that well. You, and then you still go through the loop. But I think the biggest misconception about the loop is that we always started with build. And my, my kind of experience over the years advising companies has been it's much more powerful to start with learn. OK? You start with a learning mindset, then it's, OK, I'm going to build something because we need to learn this to succeed. So the next biggest question that comes up once you figure that out is like, well, OK, what experiment do I run? <laughs> like, um, it, it's not always obvious. And, and so this is something I've been working on for the last uh, year or so. Um, partly because I want to give back to the community, partly because I'm OCD. Um, but basically, like going through and categorizing and trying to give some, some people a guide on what to do. Because it, it's really frustrating. If, if you know how to do interviews, a landing page, and survey, then that will generate some learning for you. But if it's not tied back to your risk, then it's really not going to help you. And so you're going to give this illusion of productivity by doing the thing and feeling like, OK, we've accomplished something. But then you didn't really address your risk because it didn't generate the learning that you needed. So things like interviews. Um, I think we're really customer focused on our interviews, which I love, by the way. I love that we are. But we can also focus on the backstage of our business model and start interviewing partners. And it's not going to take you very long. It's going to test more of viability and feasibility. So not so much desirability, but more about pricing and more about can we. It's not going to take you long to write scripts. It, it might take you a little while to kind of find people and assess them and, uh, and kind of screen them and, and, and do the interviews. Um, but, and the evidence strength is going to be a little bit, right? It's not going to be a slam dunk. We've nailed this. We're good. But at least you're starting to kind of figure it out. You're starting trying to figure out, hey, backstage, can we start experimenting through that too in parallel with what we're doing on the product side? Another thing uh, I love is letter of intent. And um, I was just at um, a startup competition uh, in Utah where I, I met some startups using this technique. And again, a letter of intent is like a non-binding legal document. So you're, you're asking people to put things in writing, whereas before they would just have a conversation with you. And so that can test all three themes, right? You can use that if you're B2B and you're going to your potential customers. You could have, in addition to the interview, have them you know, sign or help you craft a letter of intent, which puts it into writing. So it shouldn't take you, it's not, the cost is really low. Like, it just takes you to craft a template that you could literally find anywhere. Um, the time doesn't take very long, because you're, you could do it right with an interview or, or shortly after. And the strength is a little more. The strength, it's a little more, because um, things like people saying, well, I, I would purchase this many, but then, but then when you have them put it in writing, it's like, wait, you wrote half as many. <laughs> You told me 50, but you wrote 25. What's up with that? And, and so even mentally, it's still going to help you start qualifying, you know, uh, it's kind of vetting things a little more. And, and not only on the B2B front end, but you go to the back end as well and start looking at your suppliers too this way, right? In the supplier interview, you could say, OK, that's great. Can we just like, create a really sh short one-page LOI to put this in writing to start understanding, is this more than just what they say they'll do? You know, and, what, and what they'll actually do. And again, it, it's not a solid five, right? But it's a little better than just what they say. You can also do something like a pop-up store. Um, there's been a few here in San Francisco that have been amazing. Um, again, they test all three themes, right? And uh, basically, the cost uh, is a little more because you have to get the permits. You have to lease the space. You kind of have to do all the, the checks you know, to basically get the store up and, and there. But once you get it there, you know, you're able to kind of run these at a short period of time and generate more evidence. Now, you're generating evidence about, you know, can we, uh, is, is there interaction here qualitatively with, with the customers? But you're also learning, like, will they, will they pay for this, right? If you could do pre-purchase, right, with the store, then you start to understand, OK, not only people saying they'll buy this, they'll really pre-order this, or you could even sell some units. And so I've, I've interviewed uh, a lot of startups out here who they're just kind of test it out, right? They'll rent a, well, they'll rent a store out, 
they'll literally intercept people on the street, pull them into the store, and have a conversation with them just to start to figure that out a little bit. Um, a lot of companies that are just, again, trying to figure out distribution, play around with this to kind of validate a little bit anyway. You know, do we have another distribution channel here? And then uh, one of my all-time favorites is Wizard of Oz. And it's called Wizard of Oz because it's like the man behind the curtain, uh, obviously from the, from the movie. But um, it can also test all three. It can test customer interaction. It can test behind the scenes. And I think maybe we, um, even though this doesn't take much as far as cost because you're doing it manually, and it doesn't take much time, I find that when I talk to product managers, it's, it, it always gets, they want to deprioritize it. Like, I don't really have time <laughs> to do something manually to see if there's a fit. You know, I, we were too busy building. And it, it's kind of insane if you think about it that way, because if you just spent a little bit of time on something you know that doesn't scale and it's fine, but you're going to learn so much about manually putting together the experience that you can use that learning to the when you do build, it can inform that build. So it's also relatively strong evidence, because if you do this well, you're putting together a list of all the steps to deliver the product. You have to go out and do acquisition and line up customers, right? You, you should have a board where you, where you monitor what it takes to put this together and where you get blocked and how long it takes, right? And again, it doesn't scale and it's not meant to scale, but all that learning is really gonna help you and inform you and generate more evidence than just on the customer side, you can also start working through the back end. So uh, this is by far one of my, one of my favorite experiments. Um, the concierge is kind of a brand of this, except it's obvious the person is in the middle. So that's the biggest difference between Wizard of Oz and concierge. Uh, with concierge, it's behind the curtain, and the people aren't always, you know, they're not visible. But with a concierge, it's obvious, and it's very much like a, a service that you're offering. Both are still super valuable. It's just um, when you do Wizard of Oz, you're not necessarily biasing people with the, uh, the interaction, human interaction. Like if you were gonna put a vending machine in a store, you could just put a person there and they would sell stuff. And you'll get some learning from that, but you're also kind of biasing the customers with a person versus a machine, so just keep that in mind. So, um, where this gets super fun, at least, at least for me anyway, and people I work with, is it, you start to see patterns and you start to see like around the corners and a path forward that maybe you didn't see before. So, something like an explainer video. I think you've all seen those in the past, like the, the most famous one is Dropbox, of course. But the idea of just, I'm gonna put together a video that explains our product. And, and then it's like, well then what? Well, if you start getting familiar with these practices, you can start to say, okay, well then maybe the people with a call to action to sign up, we could deliver it manually for them. Okay. And then from there, we could actually learn from that and pull together and put together a data sheet that kind of lays out the specs in a little more detail that aren't, it isn't just detail that we dreamed up in a conference room, but it's detail that's informed by real world experiments. And then maybe you go off and interview your, your partners and see, hey, these are the specs and you have a sheet that's informed by the previous experiment. Can you deliver this? Is there something like, at what cost can you help me do this? Especially if you don't have all the expertise in house. And then you can even move it beyond that conversation to something like a letter of intent to get it in writing. So this has been like the, probably, again, the most enjoyable part for me is once you start seeing what's available to you as options, you can start piecing these together in your own kind of flow. And there's not just one right flow. I, I shared this one with you, but there are, there are hundreds of them. And it's almost like uh, a menu for you or, or kind of the recipe where you can start putting things together to get the learning you need to slowly build that strength of evidence, something where you feel really strongly about the product and about the business model. And I think that was also a big learning for me early on in my journey was, it's not that you just run, run, experiment, you have an aha moment, and then you make millions of dollars. <laughs> I've never worked with a team, by the way, that's ever experienced that. Um, it's usually a journey, and it might take you 12 weeks of going through all of this to even get to a point where you feel like, okay, we have something. So, do it more than once. Don't necessarily do one and then, and then over, over amplify. So my, my challenge to all of you is I think we keep quoting this, uh, all this responsibility and no authority. And, and, and that may, may be true. But I think you have influence. I think you have a lot of influence. 
And if you have an amazing product and the wrong business model, you're going to fail in a big way. But also, if you have an amazing business model and a terrible product, you're still going to fail. So they're very interconnected. And so when you start as product managers understanding that more and more, and you understand that there are more options to you available, that you can apply your level of thinking that you're already amazing at, and you can influence the business, and that's, that's when you're going to be super impactful. So um, I'm writing a book on this, and um, thank you for having me. Thank <laughs> you.